Good morning. This morning we will be doing more sessions on applications. And our first section is on future applications in instrumentation, sensing, and diagnostics. The session is chaired by Dr. William Fairbank of Stanford University. Dr. Fairbank has been a professor at Stanford since 1959. Before that, he was on the faculties of Duke University and Amherst College. And he also did de teaching research fellowships at the University of Washington and Yale. He's a former staff member at the MIT Radiation Laboratory, and he has maintained a special interest in low temperature physics. Dr. Fairbank will introduce his panel members, and we welcome you, Dr. Fairbank. Uh, <clears throat> before I introduce the panel members, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the extreme power of uh, low temperature physics in this field of sensing, um, instrumentation, and diagnostics. Yesterday we heard about the future applications in electronics and, com and com computing and communications and transportation and uh, power. Uh, I would like to talk about <coughs> what will and will not be uh, important applications uh, in this field we're talking about today of high temperature superconductors. I'd like to begin by just saying that, in my opinion, this is one of the most exciting times in the history of physics. Uh, and the reason this is true is because technology has enabled us to explore new regions of physics that we've never been able to explore before. And we're finding that the very foundations of physics are possibly being changed. We're finding out that we can learn something about where we came from from the very beginning of time, and that it may be possible to unify all the forces of physics at the very beginning into one a general unified theory, a dream of Einstein that never was realized in his lifetime. And low temperature physics is one of the tools by which we are able to look in these new regions of, sp of, of um, physics. I would like to, to review this slightly in order to give you the power of uh, superconductivity and then go on to talk about what aspect of this will be important for future high temperature superconductors. The first slide. Slight focus problem. Okay. The um, uh, next slide. These are some of the properties of superconductors that make uh, it possible to. Uh, explore new regions of physics. One of the most important quantities is, is flux quantization in superconductors. As we heard yesterday, it acts like a giant atom. Uh, because of flux quantization, a spinning sphere produces along its axis a perfectly uniform magnetic field called the London moment. Called the London moment. We heard about the Josephson effect. Um, Persistent currents make possible uh, persistent magnets and also very high field magnets. We can get magnetic shields where we can get very, very low, uh, completely shielded regions of uh, zero magnetic field. And we can, and the transition temperature in certain cases is very sharp. The next slide. <coughs> the next slide shows some of the devices which one can use with superconductors. Uh, the squid is perhaps one of the most important ones. And the reason it makes so much difference in uh, sensing is that it is made up not of individual electrons, but 10 to the 20-some electrons occurring in a single quantum state. 
And the transitions in between these quantum states, which are, occur in a squid, um, allow one to make a parametric amplifier, which is not limited by the zero point motion of individual electrons, as you are in semiconductors, which gives one a noise temperature inherently about one degree Kelvin. But squids can have a noise temperature a million times smaller than this, as low as 10 to the minus six degrees Kelvin. And this is a whole new tool for making very sensitive measurements. And of course, persistent current magnets, large field magnets. You can get zero magnetic shields. They've gotten superconducting shielded regions, which have uh, less than 10 to the minus eight Gauss. Uh, you can make a very sensitive thermometer. They've made a thermometer now using squids and um, magnetic uh, field, magnetic paramagnetic salts with a temperature sensitivity of 10 to the minus 10 degrees Kelvin. And they're using this to make a very fundamental new experiment on the lambda transition of helium in space. Um, you can make very sensitive bolometers for infrared detectors. You can make high Q cavities with a Q of more than 10 to the 11th. Uh, superconducting gyroscope, which I will talk about in a minute. Uh, you can make superconducting accelerometers and gradiometers that are more sensitive than any other accelerators, accelerometers. Uh, <coughs> uh, you can make accelerators, and we've heard about the uh, SSC, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that in a minute. And we can make uh, superconducting cavity accelerators um, in which the losses are a million times less than the losses in the big Stanford linear accelerator. And one can make, we're gonna hear later, NMR magnets. Um, the next slide. Some of the experiments which you can do in physics, right now there is uh, a big increase in the interest in gravitation. And one can make a gyroscopic test of general relativity, seeing the effect of the rotating Earth on the dragging of inertial frames. One can search for gravitational waves. One can uh, look for the gravitational force on antimatter and there is some indication that at laboratory distances, the inverse square law is not exactly valid. And one can do very sensitive experiments on the equivalence principle. The next slide. Uh, one can look for uh, the nature of the dark matter. 90, over 90%, 90 maybe 99% of the universe is unobservable. And the question is, what is it? It may be black holes, it may be massive neutrinos, it might be a new kind of particle called axions, uh, it might be partly made up of stochastic gravitational radiation left over from the Big Bang, and superconducting uh, circuits are making possible looking for all these different backgrounds. Next slide. Uh, you can search for new fundamental particles, uh, the new high energy accelerator, both at Fermi Lab and the SSC, use very large superconducting magnets. You look for, look for relics from the Big Bang, fractional electric charges, magnetic monopoles, axions, or a very strange thing called strings left over from the early um, universe. Now I'd like to show you just a couple of examples of how low temperature physics helps this. This is a picture of a five-ton aluminum bar that's cooled to liquid helium temperatures uh, to look for gravitational radiation. If a star collapses in our galaxy the way it did recently in the supernova, then Einstein's theory says a gravitational wave goes out from the star, and when it goes past the Earth, in this case uh, 150,000 years later, this bar will expand and contract, according to the theory, by about 10 to the minus 16 centimeters for a thousandth of a second. And then the gravity wave will continue on its way. Now, how in the world could you see the motion of an aluminum bar more than a thousand times smaller than the, than the size of a nucleus? 
It turns out that if one makes a mechanical transducer on the end of the bar and attaches it to one of these squids, that one can see these very small motions. And one of the exciting things about gravitational radiation is that one can look at a whole new way at our universe. Instead of looking at individual particles and their radiation, one can look at the motion of very large masses. And it is predicted by some theorists that when the world began in the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds with a Big Bang, that information in the form of stochastic gravitational radiation is left over, which is now um, bouncing around the universe like the black body radiation, and sensitive detectors like this would have a chance of observing this. The next slide shows the test of Einstein's general relativity theory by a gyroscope going around the Earth. As the Earth rotates, it is supposed to drag the inertial frame of the universe, and uh, these gyroscopes, if they were perfect, always pointing in the same direction, if one compared them with a distant star, then would find that after this had gone around the Earth uh, for a whole year, that the gyroscope would have shifted its direction by five hundredths of a second of arc. Now, if one wanted to measure that to two percent, that would be a thousandth of a second of arc. That is the angle of a human hair at ten miles. And how do you make such a gyroscope? You make it perfectly spherical and um, within a fraction of a millionth of an inch, and perfectly homogeneous. And then you take it out in space where gravity is balanced, and you look at the spinning axis. And how can you look at the axis? Well, along, if you coat it with a superconductor, the next slide shows a, a superconducting ball. Along its axis of spin, you see a very small magnetic field. And if you put a superconducting loop around this and attach it to a squid, as the gyroscope changes its direction, it produces a current in the loop, and that can be detected by this very sensitive squid. And the reason I show this is it dramatically shows how sensitive these squids are. The next slide sh shows a signal, which uh, a simulated signal, which is 20 thousandths of a second of arc, uh, the size of the relativity signal after a year, and here's the noise at a thousandth of a second of arc, and it shows that this gyroscope can detect a direction which is about a million times better than the best gyroscopes on Earth. Um, now, is this a practical thing for room temperature? Well, the experiment itself needs to be done at low temperatures, but if one could coat a sphere with high temperature superconducting material, and if the squids could be made with comparable sensitivity at high se temperatures, then would, one could make a 360 degree gyroscope, which would be an absolute reference for things like the Large Space Telescope. The next slide shows another very interesting detector. Uh, this is a signal uh, in a superconducting loop on Valentine's Day about three years ago by Ross Cabrera in Stanford. The prediction is that there's some very peculiar properties uh, formed in the early universe called monopoles. Instead of a dipole magnet, they only have one pole. If one of these went through a superconducting loop, it would leave behind a persistent current. And on this Valentine's Day, that's exactly what happened to this superconducting loop. If this is true, it's one of the most important things in physics. But searches since then, with a thousand times the sensitivity, have not seen any more monopoles. And the question is, are there these monopoles left over from the early universe? We need very large area superconductors to look for uh, very, very rare events. And they talk about making 100 square meters of superconducting loops, each attached to a squid. And if you, if you had the possibility, you'd like 1,000 square meters. Now, this is very difficult to do at helium temperatures, but if one had a room temperature, for example, uh, superconductor, one could make very large areas. Now, all of these things are special physics experiments. And they are a one of a kind, and uh, 
and not very important from a practical aspect of industry there is one application which is not quite so small the next slide shows a picture of washington d c and this is the super collider if it were to be made around washington d c and you see it uh, would approximately equal the uh, road or around washington d c it's about 50 or 60 miles long, made of 65 kilogauss superconducting magnets. Now it turns out that uh, it's an advantage to have helium temperatures in this because it makes a very perfect vacuum. There's very good wire at present to make this superconducting magnet, and the low temperature refrigeration is only a small part of the total cost. So even in this case, the, su the room temperature superconductor doesn't look too important. But there is an application for very sensitive sensing, which is very important for uh, room temperature superconductor, and that is another class of objects of which there are five billion in the world, and that is people. It turns out that magnetic fields have been very important in physics, but have been very unimportant in medicine, and the reason is that the fields are so small. The field from the heart is about uh, 10 to the minus 6 gauss. The field from the brain is about 10 to the minus 8 gauss. And they have been unobservable in past experiments. But because of the squid, because of superconducting magnets, which can uh, polarize nuclei, there is now a revolution going on in medicine uh, using uh, superconducting techniques. And we're going to hear from the next speaker about this and how uh, room temperature superconductors could help. The next speaker is Samuel J. Williamson. He got his PhD at uh, MIT in 1965. He has been very instru instrumental in uh, research in the field of superconductivity. And he has uh, almost singularly applied this field to the study of currents in the brain. Um, he is a professor of physics a professor of physics, an adjunct professor of physiology and biophysics at New York University. Um, on joining the university in 1971, he established the Low Temperature Laboratory, where research was conducted on structural instabilities and high temperature superconductors and magnetic transitions in antiferromagnetic and spin glass. But the real important thing for our conference here is together with Professor Leon Kaufman, he founded the Neuromagnetism Laboratory, where ultra-sensitive magnetic field sensors are being employed to study the magnetic fields from the brain. And we will now hear from Samuel Williams. As, um Bill Fairbank indicated superconducting sensors are essential for monitoring most of the magnetic fields associated with biological activity in the human body. And we call this area of study biomagnetism. The first slide, please. I should distinguish uh, this area of study from uh, that which is uh, concerned with the effect which magnetic fields may have on biological function. This latter area has suffered uh, from many questionable episodes in its history, and uh, anyway is more properly known as magnetobiology. So the first slide uh, indicates what uh, we would like to define by the term biomagnetism. The next slide shows that there are a variety of sources in the human body that produce magnetic fields, and uh, you can read this uh, catalog for yourselves. The strongest of these fields, that associated with electrical currents in the heart, um, can be measured by induction coils, but only through signal averaging techniques. In fact, the application of uh, the squid technology to biomagnetism uh, was affected by uh, Ed, Ed Adelsack of the Office of Naval Research, who recognized the advantage of combining two technologies, a super, superconducting detector and uh, magnetic shielding. And he arranged a collaboration between David Cohen at the MIT Francis Bitter National Magnet Laboratory, uh, where the first effective magnetic shield had been established, and by Jim Zimmerman at the National Bureau of Standards, who had developed the first 
uh, practical squid. And with this combination, it was possible to measure the magnetic field of the heart without uh, any averaging procedure. And the quality of the signal was comparable to that of the electrocardiogram. What I'm going to focus on today uh, is the weakest of this set of biomagnetic signals, the magnetic field of the brain. Next slide. These magnetic fields arise from ionic currents in active neurons. Uh, for frequencies of interest to us, we can consider the body and head as transparent to these fields, so they emerge from the active region without distortion. And it's possi possible through measurements of the magnetic field pattern about the scalp to deduce where in three-dimensional space the source is located. Next slide. So the idea here is to measure the field pattern, find out where fields emerge and where they enter the scalp using an appropriate sensor. Next slide. The principle of this is quite simple. In fact, it goes back to the early uh, 1800s when Bio and Savar noted that wherever a electrical current is flowing, there'll be a magnetic field in the surrounding space. And the upper left-hand panel shows the illustration of a telephone line with a communication current passing along it. And we know very well that a magnetic field uh, is, encircles that line in the surrounding space. Well, the same principle applies to a single nerve cell within the human brain. That's shown at the lower left. Uh, here we have a neuron. In fact, it's responding to inputs from surrounding neurons uh, whose synapses produce a change in the uh, permeability of the uh, of the membrane and allow ions to enter through ionic channels. These ions are conducted along the dendrites, the dendritic tree on the left, toward the cell body or soma. And uh, the, a lot of the uh, logical processes of this neuron are carried out as these individual currents summate on approaching the cell body. If the total current is sufficiently strong, then an action potential is initiated and that travels along the axon to be projected to another place on the cortex or perhaps to a deeper region in the brain. Now, the time constants involved with these different processes differ. A uh, time constant associated with dendritic currents are on the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds, whereas the time constant associated with the action potential is on the order of uh, 1 to 2 milliseconds. We know from the work uh, primarily of John Wixwell and collaborators at Vanderbilt University both the theoretical and experimental studies, uh, that the theory for the action field, if we call it that, associated with the action potential is well established. The same kind of theory can apply to the activity in the dendrites, which is a slower activity. And uh, one of the outcomes of the application of this theory is the prediction that if we look for the magnetic field from an isolated, from a single uh, neuron, uh, with a sensor that's one to two centimeters away, we simply can't detect it. In fact, if we take the observed magnetic fields, measured just outside the scalp, we deduce that there must be on the order of 1,000 to perhaps 100,000 neurons that are coherently active to produce such a strong field. So what we measure with neuromagnetic techniques is the activity of self-selective populations of neurons which in my opinion is an advantage anyway, since I don't believe that human behavior is dictated by a single neuron. Rather, um, I would rather depend on the activity of a coherent set of perhaps 10 to the fourth neurons to gain a little more predictability in what I'll do in the future. So on the right, we show this, this uh, concept where if there's an active uh, population of neurons, the magnetic field will emerge from one region of the scalp and enter another region. Next slide. Uh, this really is the case. In uh, 1978, uh, Doug Brenner and Lloyd Kaufman and I carried out measurements of the simplest sort, which showed, in fact, a rather confined field pattern over the scalp. Uh, the experiment was simply to stimulate the little finger of the right hand. Uh, we applied electrical stimulation, current pulses at uh, one milliamp uh, amplitude and uh, one millisecond duration at a rate of, say, 10 per second or 15 per second, and we looked over the contralateral side of the head for a magnetic field varying at that same rate. Now, we knew where to look because we had a lot of data obtained during uh, neurosurgical procedures 
where a portion of the skull is removed in order to, uh, for example, remove a lesion or to remove an area of the brain uh, that might be epileptic. And during the course of this kind of uh, procedure, the neurosurgeons, uh, with the patient's permission, would carry out various experiments, for example, stimulating the little finger of the right hand. And with electrodes placed directly on the brain, they could de determine where the responding area of the so-called somatosensory portion of the brain uh, is located. And that agrees quite well with the center of the pattern. Here we show constant field contours uh, in a view from the top of the head. And uh, this standard view shows that the center of this pattern is located on a tuck in the cortex, about two and a half centimeters deep, called the Rolandic fissure. Now, it's in the depths of that fissure, uh, along, in fact, this posterior bank, where you'd expect to see response to little finger stimulation. So we didn't find anything new in this experiment, but we did demonstrate that without having to move, remove a portion of the skull, it was possible to determine in three dimensions where the activity arises. Now, if one uh, looks at this pattern and you think back to your physics courses, uh, you can deduce the nature of the underlying current source. It's simply a short element of current that's oriented at right angles to the line joining these two field extrema. So a short element of current could represent current, in fact, flowing along the dendritic trees of a population of neurons the pyramidal cells of the cortex. Uh, furthermore, this concept shows you that the distance between the two extreme is a very important parameter because that gives us an idea of the depth of the source. In fact, if we model the head as a sphere, uh, the deeper the source lies in that sphere, the farther apart will be these two field extrema. So that we have a way of determining uh, not only the lateral position, but the depth of sources within the brain. Next slide. So the picture that emerges and that we've shown in our laboratory is that if you look at responses to semantic or visual or auditory stimulation, we always find this relationship. When the field pattern has this direction and a source of flows in the direction shown here by this vector Q, uh, if you measure the potential across the scalp, you'll see that it's positive at this place, negative at this place, and the current associated with the potential is flowing in the opposite direction to the current associated with the field. So the currents associated with the electroencephalogram measured at the scalp flow in the opposite direction from the currents associated with the magnetic field. Magnetically, we have a direct measure of neural activity, whereas electrically, once looking at activity associated with currents that have diffused through the intervening tissue. And so the field pattern is very sensitive to the nature and electrical properties of that tissue, in particular to the high resistivity skull, which tends to smear out this pattern and broaden its features. This is one advantage of the magnetic technique, whereby, to first order, it's independent of the intervening tissue, whereas the electrical measurements are first order dependent, very much so, on that tissue. Next slide. Well, this is the story. One needs squids to detect such weak magnetic fields. Next slide illustrates the application of a squid. Uh, it's not necessary to use a magnetically shielded room for many applications. Uh, if you're interested in activity in the frequency range above, say, 3 hertz or so, it can be done in an unshielded environment. Here we show a single sensor system. The squid is inside this doer. The doer is filled with liquid helium. Next slide. What makes it possible to detect fields in such a noisy environment uh, as our laboratory, which is 12 floors above the uh, BMT line in Manhattan, uh, is the use of a superconducting uh, gradiometer uh, consisting, in fact, of uh, three independent coils, three sets of coils here, uh, the center uh, having twice as many turns and wound in the opposite direction as the two end coils. And the basic idea of gradiometers of this sort is to discriminate against distant sources of noise, which produce fairly uniform fields, and still retain sensitivity to local sources, such as the brain's activity, where the field just links appreciably the lowest coil. Next slide. Now, there have been developments since uh, those early days of the single sensor unit. Uh, it's OK for graduate students to move a door around if you have to measure 40, 50, or 60 positions to determine a field pattern. But when professors have to do that, we start to think of alternative approaches. <laughs> the alternative approach is to write proposals 
so that you can have multiple sensor systems developed. Now, parenthetically, I'd like to remark that in the early days of this neuromagnetic game, uh, it, it turned out that uh, the, the notion of measuring the magnetic field of the brain to understand brain activity was not successful in peer review appraisals. And, uh, and I have to acknowledge the uh, greater foresight that uh, Don Woodward at the Office of Naval Research had and Al Fragley at the uh, Air Force Office of Scientific Research uh, because they provided the kind of funding that kept us going. In particular, the Navy provided funding to develop a five sensor system, and the Air Force has provided funding for a magnetically shielded room. And the combination of these two technologies, plus a software adaptive filtering, has now, in my opinion, eliminated the noise problem in our laboratory, which uh, I will claim is the most noisy site in the world for biomagnetic studies. So the noise is now sensor limited and flat down to approximately one tenth of a hertz. Next slide. This shows an x-ray of the interior of the door. There are five sensors, one in the center. Uh, these are detection coil forms shown here, vacuum space out here, curvature so it nestles against the subject's head. And uh, the dimensions are eight, eight centimeters length and 1.5 centimeters diameter for each coil. Next. Uh, we have a second laboratory at New York University at Bellevue Hospital in the NYU Medical Center. Uh, this is a result of a collaboration between NYU and Biomagnetic Technologies Incorporated. You see in this uh, assembly of two doers, uh, well, you don't see them, but they're in there, uh, there's a set of 22 squids, uh, 14 of which are measuring simultaneously the magnetic field of the head. Next. Uh, there's been a lot of advice to entrepreneurs and young companies, and I offer another piece of advice. There's a time when uh, one should uh, uh, leave the physicists and go to the engineers. Uh, we have gone through a number of gantry systems that were designed by physicists, including myself, and all of them more or less work, but they really aren't practical. Here's a wonderful set designed by engineers. And these you can just push a button and release the CO2 brakes and move the door around, place it over the head as you wish. Next slide. Uh, we're also turning swords into, pl into plowshares here. Uh, we need to know where these sensors are quite accurately. Uh, here is a device developed by the Air Force for fighter planes. It's an actually based on a helmet-mounted gun sight arrangement. Uh, we use the transmitters and sensors here to determine the position and orientation of these doers uh, relative to a head-based coordinate system with an accuracy of a better than two millimeters. Next slide. Now let me show you why we're making all this effort. I can only give you one or two examples in the time allotted. Uh, the real question here is one of obtaining a functional image of the brain. Uh, this is distinct from anatomical images that are provided by CT or MRI scans. Now this functional image we'll call an NMI for neuromagnetic image. And it's obtained as a, in the first step uh, through measurements of the field pattern over the scalp. The question we're addressing in the study I show here is whether in the auditory center of the human brain we have a tone map. That is, whether tones of different frequencies evoke activity at specific locations in the brain. Now, we know that's true for animals of various species, but up until the neuromagnetic studies I'm reporting here were done, uh, there had been no evidence of such a map in the human. So with Gianluca Romani from the University of Rome, we measured the field pattern as we applied tones of different frequencies to a set of airline earphones, if I remember correctly, United Airlines earphones. And uh, the idea was to turn on and off this tone very gracefully, so we modulated it in sine wave fashion at, say, 32 times per second. We looked for a magnetic field at that modulation rate and could observe that uh, because there is a population of cells in your brain that responds preferentially, preferentially to the presence of a tone, not to the individual pressure variations, but the presence of a tone. And here are the field patterns for two, 100, 200, 600, 2,000 hertz tone. And the big thing I want to point out here is that if you look at the distance between the extrema, it increases monotonically with tone frequency. So on the side of your head, higher frequency tones produce activity deeper in the brain than uh, low frequency tones. Next slide shows how this maps. 
Uh, the slide on the other projector, please. You can keep this one on, but I need the other projector. Uh, it's possible then to determine in three dimensions the sequence of uh, activity in, in the brain for tones of different frequencies. And as uh, soon as we get that focused, I'll show you a set of three projections in character form at the top of the subject's head. And you see the uh, shaded areas have been blown up below to illustrate the sequence of individual sources in the brain. Here we have uh, four sources corresponding to the frequencies shown here. And the span of distances here are roughly uh, two centimeters. Uh, roughly one-tenth of a unit here is a one centimeter for this individual. So it's a very orderly sequence. And uh, this is the top view looking down on the brain. Deeper for higher frequencies and also lateral shift. Now, the question is whether we're this, this determination from outside the head is reasonable in terms of anatomy. So we've compared this with an MRI scan of the same subject shown in the next slide. Uh, this is the side view of the head, and unfortunately you can't see the jaw and other features because we have a small screen. But uh, what's important here is to recognize that where we place uh, this uh, source is exactly in the sylvian fissure, and the auditory cortex lies on the floor of the sylvian fissure. This white line is the fissure. Uh, another example of that is shown in the front view of the head here, and this white line here is the sylvian fissure, and here's where we place the source. Now, its position is exactly where you'd expect auditory cortex, and the kind of accuracy that this evidence presents for us is on the order of uh, two to three millimeters in the placement of the source. And that's all for the left, and I'll keep the right side. As uh, physicists, we were interested to see whether there's a mathematical relationship uh, for this uh, tonotopic map, and indeed, there's a relationship that distance across the cortex varies as the logarithm of the frequency. Next slide shows uh, one of the implications of that for the musicians among you. Uh, that says that we're devoting equal numbers of neurons to each octave of the frequency scale. We're emphasizing neither the lower end or the right upper end, and so we have a map here across human cortex that's very much like the piano keyboard. It's very close to what the cochlea provides for us, too. Next slide. Uh, just, this is to, just a quick one to show you that it's possible to see deep sources in the brain. I don't have time to describe the nature of the experiment. It's an experiment that's been very popular in cognitive psychology related to how your brain responds to an unexpected situation. 1,500 papers have been published on studies of this type without knowing where the source of the activity lies in the brain. Uh, we provide here the first evidence for activity uh, based on measurements outside the head. And the activity lies in the hippocampal formation, uh, which is indeed related to uh, clearly implicated in aspects of short-term and long-term memory. Next slide. What I'd like to do is show you one example from the clinical domain. Uh, these are data obtained at UCLA on uh, an epile epileptic patient. Uh, if you can see this, uh, this represents an interictal activity, that is, between epileptic ep episodes, in which uh, there is a, a four-wave complex where uh, a field pattern shown here can be related to a source at this location. Then the next polarity wave shifts the source, the next polarity back to the first location, next uh, wave uh, the second location. So there are two sources in this individual which oscillate in activity. And the following slide shows the CT scans on these individuals with the region of pathology shown by the clear white area here. And one source lies right in the boundary of pathology and normal tissue. And the other source lies in a region, uh, another boundary between normal tissue and the region of pathology. And this is seen very, in fact, in all cases that I'm aware of, this, this relationship is found that is interictal activity localized magnetically and lies at the boundary of diseased tissue and uh, provides another confirmation in this sense of the localization ability. Now, in, the, in point of fact, this is useful for treatment because now with the surgical techniques, it's possible to alleviate focal epilepsy in a fairly large number of patients. Next slide. Uh, for those who are concerned with uh, profits, it's certainly the clinical work and not the research work where profits lie. 
and I'm not going to say that profits are necessarily there. Uh, what I do want to point out is that there are, there are very serious efforts now in a large number of institutions to exploit the possibility that neuromagnetism can be useful in clinical applications. These are a few. Uh, there are two that are left out here. One is the University of Rome, where a very active group is involved, and the second is uh, the University of Munster in Germany. Next slide. So where do room temperature squids come in? We're not sure. If they can be made as uh, sensitive as present squids, they'd be an advantage, but we do not want to lose sensitivity in this technique. Next slide. I think we all see that the advantage is in the detection coil. Uh, one reason is that it's a simpler cryogenic problem uh, in terms of uh, getting these coils closer to the head. A vacuum space can be thinner. Uh, you can take a greater heat leak and so forth. Next slide. Um, but I think here is where the real advantage comes. If we can have room temperature superconductors, we can avoid this problem. Now, if you look around you, you've discovered that people really do not have spherical heads. <laughs> and so you lose a lot of sensitivity if you can't have a flexible door or get those coils close. Next slide. So you see if we have a room temperature superconductor for our pickup coils, we can nestle those coils uh, very close to the subject, whether it's a child or an adult. Next slide. Uh, Bill Fairbank ought to enjoy this because I think he first suggested that a superconducting shield might be useful for providing a low, no, low noise environment. Uh, those of you in materials research can recognize I've oversimplified this a little bit. But basically, you roll on the material, you heat treat it, you add the door, and then you've got your low temperature, your, your, your room temperature superconducting shield. Next slide. Whether that's a reality or one uses a magnetic shield is, is somewhat beyond, beside the point. Um, on thinking about this whole business, it occurred to me that it's, it's truly ironic that uh, we accept the notion that, that we should have an annual dental exam. We've hardly considered the possibility of an annual brain exam. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is that there was never a technology that would permit rapid evaluation of brain function with high detail. And the second is the lack of an appropriate database. And it's certainly clear that early detection of disorders in the brain should improve the prognosis for subsequent treatment. For example, in the case of epilepsy, if one could detect epileptic activity early when there's a single focus, we could think about new techniques, the non-invasive, well, invasive but non-surgical techniques, such as ion beam implantation of energy at precise locations to remove the lesion. And uh, in effect, simply a small area of tissue, a few millimeters in extent. It's required, you need early detection for that before multiple foci develop. We can imagine a battery of tests that take perhaps 15 minutes, in which we could assess uh, sensory functions, cognitive functions, sensory motor activity, short-term, long-term memory, in a, in a routine fashion by the contactless method of neuromagnetic uh, measurements here with an array of 120 sensors, for example. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's no longer a question as to uh, whether such an annual brain check will occur, whether it be developed. It's more a question of when. And, uh, and I think I'd argue that the neuromagnetic approach appears to be the most uh, promising on the horizon uh, for uh, applications of that sort. And uh, for those of you thinking about room temperature superconductors, the key element that I find in their application to this approach is in the flexibility it provides to, for positioning coils near the head to enhance sensitivity and thereby, thereby make it possible to assess brain function in both adults and children. So thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. There was an article in the National Enquirer a while ago that said that uh, an airplane flying over a house could read people's brains, and they were worrying about that. But I think that this is premature. Um, the next speaker, uh, John Steckley, um, received his Doctor of Science degree also from MIT in 1959. 
He has done, been one of the uh, leading pioneers in all aspects of, of superconducting magnets. He, he was founder and uh, chairman of the board and technical director of Magnetics Corporation of America from 1969 to 1986. At the present, he's vice president of advanced uh, programs in Intermagnetics General Corporation, and he is very much in the frontier of this exciting new development of looking at what we call MMR, MRI imaging. Uh, he is a member of the uh, National Academy of Engineering. Mr. Stacy. Well, I'm uh, happy to be here uh, to talk to you about uh, the largest applications of superconductors so far, and uh, uh, very applicable to the uh, conference title. The application is indeed uh, commercial. Uh, about 15 years ago, when uh, uh, we were trying to find uses for superconductors, indeed that were commercial, we went through several uh, false starts. I think the closest we ever came was uh, a perfume called Magnetic Moment, but uh, <laughs> uh, we just couldn't figure out how superconductivity would, uh, you know, would fit into the picture. Maybe the pairing of electrons or something, something of that type. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, MRI uh, is currently a medically uh, accepted technique uh, for imaging. It is used clinically daily. There are over 1,000 systems uh, that have been installed worldwide. So we're not talking about a small, uh, a small application. Uh, each one of these systems typically costs, and again, uh, the lower end isn't really significant, uh, $1 million. Uh, to $2 million, which is, which is more typical. So uh, this represents a major investment in, in equipment, instrumentation, and superconducting magnets uh, uh, that people use not for research, uh, but in everyday uh, clinical applications. Now, you heard a little bit about that yesterday and uh, uh, from uh, Sibley uh, Burnett, but I would hope to give you a little bit of the flavor for, for where the future lies. Uh, we don't need to wait for the future uh, of this application. It, it is already here. And uh, I would hope to uh, discuss a little bit about how uh, the new applications uh, of high critical temperature materials might affect uh, 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 this very exciting modality. Uh, now, my first slide, uh, if I may have the first slide, uh, 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 this is a General Electric slide, which uh, uh, I obtained. Uh, sort of answers the question that was posed by the previous speaker, uh, is the head round? <laughs> and uh, I'm not really going to answer that question, but uh, anyway, it clearly, it clearly pre you know, presents a very detailed picture, not only of the outside of the head, but of the inside of the head. And uh, uh, these images have sub-millimeter resolution uh, in the uh, latest uh, systems that are uh, in existence. Now, what you're looking at here is an image uh, of protons uh, in the uh, uh, water molecules that uh, is in the body. Now, the body, uh, from uh, my point of view, is nothing more than a than a bag filled with uh, water with some sticks in it uh, that represent the, represent the bones. So since it's mostly water, uh, uh, we have uh, a large amount of material to draw from. And indeed, uh, imaging uh, currently is based on, on imaging protons. Uh, the future uh, will probably uh, be in imaging things other uh, than protons. It's sort of, sort of like doing chemistry with only one element. Uh, uh, it, you know, it may be fun for a while, and uh, since uh, you know, that's the accessible element, this may be what you do first, but certainly there, there, there are many other, uh, uh, there's 
a vast richness of information that lies under the surface. And I would hope to convey some of this, uh, this to you as I, as I go on. Anyway, uh, uh, the next uh, slide, uh, and you, again, you saw a picture of a truck uh, going yesterday. I, I thought I'd sh uh, show you a picture of a, of a truck coming. <laughs> uh, it's a very special uh, truck. Uh, at the back of the truck, it's got a superconducting magnet. Now, it, clearly, you can't tell from the outside that there's a superconducting magnet in it. Uh, and uh, if you, if I may have the, the next slide, you may get an idea of just what is what is inside that truck. Uh, to your uh, left uh, is the uh, magnet. It's uh, generally disguised. People don't uh, people don't like to look at magnets. Uh, they put them in plastic boxes, which is what you see here, and they leave a hole. And the hole is so that you can uh, get into the magnet and uh, uh, make the images. Uh, the uh, the control uh, for the uh, system uh, is is here, and all of the computers and other other necessary instrumentation uh, are in the other part of the truck. The truck has a complete diagnostic system on it, and typically may move from hospital to hospital three times a week, and uh, uh, the patients uh, come to the truck in the parking lot and uh, are, are imaged on a, on a routine basis. Uh, this has uh, cost advantages in many, in, in many instances, as well as allows sighting of the uh, uh, magnets in, in, in areas that you couldn't find a, a space uh, that was suitable uh, to put a system like this in. Most radiolo radiological departments are in the basement, uh, and uh, it's difficult to put magnets in, in, in very small uh, cubby holes. If you, if you go to any hospital uh, and go to the basement, this is where you will generally find the radiological department and uh, they don't really have very much room, and, and getting a magnet in there is indeed one of the major, major problems. Now, uh, the next slide will give you an idea. I don't mean to, to teach you what NNMR is or anything of that type, but it's sort of like the, the, the map of the United States by a New Englander. Uh, this is sort of the, the map of a MRI system uh, from a magnet point of view. Uh, the magnet is, uh, uh, is this uh, large box on, on the left, and it consists of a superconducting magnet. The rest of the system is uh, necessary, but, uh, you know, clearly a lot less, uh, less important. And, and since this is a, a meeting on, on superconductors, uh, uh, clearly we ought to concentrate on the, you know, on the most important part. But nevertheless, I, I did want to call your attention that there are uh, significant other pieces of, of uh, hardware and uh, and software involved in in, in making these images. And to, to the extent superconducting uh, computers are going to uh, uh, fit on the on the top of the podium here, I think we should be able to fit them in the in the truck without any problem. Uh, now I've shown you a picture of the head. Uh, the next slide shows a picture of of something that you might not recognize. This is a uh, cross-section of the body, uh, it shows what's called a gated picture of the heart. Again, this is a slide obtained from, uh, from General Electric. Uh, what you're looking at here is the uh, pulmonary cavity, and the heart region uh, is uh, shown here. Uh, uh, these images are, uh, for those of you that can't imagine uh, uh, how this slice occurs, uh, this is if you, if you uh, stand in the guillotine uh, sideways and have the blade uh, come <laughs> straight down the middle. And then you take the two parts apart and uh, uh, take a look at them anyway. Uh, it's easier to do it with, uh, with MRI than... Uh, Another uh, 
very interesting technique, uh, again, this uh, slide comes from uh, General Electric, uh, is the ability to uh, uh, image things that are moving. So clearly when uh, the patient is, uh, is, is laying down, uh, he's not doing very much, uh, much moving, of course his, his heart uh, is moving, but uh, the next slide shows a picture of the uh, blood vessels uh, with the rest of the anatomy removed. Now this is in the neck head region where you're looking at the major blood vessels uh, that go in, from the neck up, up, up to the head. Again, this is a technique uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is relatively new and uh, I, I couldn't show you a slide like this probably a, a, a year ago and I expect that next year I'll be able to, uh, again if I'm invited to the conference, I'll be able to show you uh, slides that are very significantly improved from, uh, from these. Uh, the, uh, it's a very rapidly moving field and uh, what uh, I, I still recall uh, one, one statement made by an expert uh, maybe five or six uh, years ago that said because the heart is moving, MRI will never uh, uh, be a modality useful for the heart and yet you you see, you see uh, uh, pictures of the heart being made on a, on a routine basis. Uh, now, the next uh, slide uh, just su summarizes some of the, the applications. Again, uh, the technique is visual. The radiologists are used to seeing uh, pictures, and so uh, uh, when MRI came along, this was a better camera to take pictures with and you don't need to do anything else than look at a picture. Uh, the next uh, slide uh, shows, uh, I'll give you uh, a few minutes to see whether you recognize that. that uh, this is an egg, and uh, it was part of a series uh, of images made at uh, the IGC uh, Imaging Lab at R RPI. Uh, they followed the whole development of the, of the embryo over uh, uh, whatever the gestation period is up to, up to the time that the chick came out. I think it's important to point out that applications other than just the straight medical applications are very likely uh, in uh, 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 monitoring uh, of uh, uh, chemical or uh, biological processes by, by this technique is certainly in the cards. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, I'm always drawn to, to you know, to to the magnet. So, uh, and since this is what you're what you're here for, I'll uh, tell you a little about uh, those. Uh, the range of magnetic fields in the uh, systems that are out now range up to two tesla. Uh, most of them you, you'll find are uh, one and a half tesla and below. Uh, 0.6 is typical, one and a half is typical. Uh, recently, they have been uh, two, four Tesla systems built for, uh, for research. And uh, generally what a higher field uh, does for you, uh, it gives you more signal. Now for protons, uh, uh, if you're going to look at images only, uh, you have more than enough signal as it is. However, if you're going to do what I call spectroscopy, or do other types of chemistry than, than protons, you do need more signal. And this is where uh, higher fields uh, are very beneficial. If you have a weak signal, the higher the field, the better. And if you're going to do spectroscopy, the higher the field, the more separation uh, you get between any, any two uh, peaks uh, in a spectrum. Now the things that spectroscopy allow you to do, even in protons, if you go, uh, if you really look at the spectrum, you find out that there are two uh, lines in the spectrum. Now I find those very easy to remember. Uh, one of them is water and is very abundant, and uh, the other one is fat. So you have a fat line and you have a water line, and uh, 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 you're able to distinguish uh, the two uh, by uh, techniques of this type. You can make a fat image and a water image. And indeed, you compare the two, and uh, people have uh, tried uh, to correlate uh, the ratio of uh, fat to water locally 
uh, to uh, uh, leukemia or other, uh, other diseases of the, of the blood. Uh, uh, I should mention that there's a proposed project uh, to uh, develop a, a 10 Tesla system proposed by uh, uh, Paul Lauterbur uh, and uh, some of his uh, associates. Yeah, but again, that doesn't uh, exist in hardware. Next slide. Uh, back to the magnet. Uh, this is what a, the superconducting magnet looks like, and again, it's very, very similar to the one you saw, you saw yesterday. Uh, the mobile application was uh, was pioneered by, by IGC, uh, and uh, there are over a hundred mobile systems out now. They operate on a, on a routine basis. After uh, IGC pioneered uh, this application, there was. Uh, Again, from a commercial point of view, the uh, competition developed both uh, overseas and uh, in uh, places like San Diego. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows the uh, cross-section of the superconductor that goes into it, and this is what we base our whole technology on. Next slide. Show the fine. Uh, you may not be able to show this. This shows the fine filaments that we're able to achieve uh, using uh, niobium titanium superconductor. Next. Uh, uh, if you cut away the magnet, you'll find that it has been very well insulated. We've had to vacuum, we've had to use many shells, and uh, this is what forms the costly part of the system, the cryogenics. It's very hard to operate at four degrees. Next slide. Uh, this shows the refrigeration that we have to uh, attach when we don't uh, uh, operate by putting helium in in an open cycle mode. Uh, the refrigerator goes into the system and provides refrigeration at three different uh, temperature levels. Uh, the next slide uh, shows a picture of the hardware uh, uh, that goes uh, into this uh, system. Uh, I'm very much heartened by the fact that this is significantly smaller than some of the refrigerators that were required for the uh, computer systems. Uh, evidently, the smaller the size, uh, the larger the refrigeration appears to, to be. Anyway, uh, these magnets are very efficient as far as their thermal, uh, thermal design. Uh, nevertheless, uh, a large part of the cost is associated with the, with the cryogenic system, and high-temperature superconductors would make a major impact on that. Next slide. Uh, this shows a picture of the magnets being, uh, being made. Again, you see a lot of cylindrical components. There's a lot of shells that go, go into the system that contribute to the cost. Next. If, uh, if we did have room temp uh, a 77 degree K superconductor, and bear in mind there's a, there's a big if, we need something that can be wound into magnets uh, reliably. And this is what we have now. Now, if we had that, this is what the system would look like. We would need very simple insulation at nitrogen temperature. For those of you that are not familiar uh, with nitrogen, uh, uh, the food, uh, refrigerated food trucks on the road, uh, they tell me that about 10% of those food trucks uh, use liquid nitrogen for, for cooling. Nitrogen is generally available, uh, and uh, it's uh, a lot easier to use than heating. Next. Uh, if you dream a little further, uh, we would get to room temperature. We wouldn't need any uh, major thermal insulation on the system whatsoever. The next... Uh, uh, I did want to quickly mention some of the other possible elements. Uh, these are the important ones. Again, the hydrogen is the one we're using now. Uh, you should know that uh, we're also composed of carbon. Uh, again, organic molecules always uh, contain carbon. 
Phosphorus is very important to study uh, muscles uh, and uh, other uh, bioenergetic uh, uh, details. Sodium can tell you uh, the state of the health of a, of a cell. And fluorine can be used to study perfusion. Uh, next. Uh, why don't I skip this? Next slide. Uh, I just want to show you two slides that I obtained from Columbia University. The first slide is a proton picture of the cross-section of the brain. Uh, you will notice in this region uh, an abnormality. I don't want to really go into any details. The rest of the brain looks quite normal. Uh, it's very difficult to tell from a picture like this what the problem is. The next slide shows some sodium pictures. You notice the sodium pictures are quite poor. Nevertheless, even with these poor images, you're able to come to the conclusion that this is not a malignancy and indeed treat the patient accordingly. The sodium pictures were necessary. And this is what I see is the future. Uh, uh, to conclude, I want to emphasize that we need the conductor before, any, you know, before we can use any high temperature materials in the magnets. The magnets are an enabling technology. Magnetic fields will become more generally available if you have less refrigeration. However, the modality exists already and will just make it easier to apply both at the current field levels as well as at the higher field levels. Thank you very much for this <coughs> very interesting talk. <coughs> we'll now go on to the next session. We have a, uh, a message for Amit Dasgupta. There is an urgent message for you, which is on the bulletin board in the lobby area uh, near the elevators. If you would go pick that up, please. Amit Dasgupta. Well, we have all been dazzled by the potential applications for superconductivity at high temperatures. Uh, we now have a panel to throw a wet blanket on all of that. The panel is led by Dr. Robert White, and they will address the critical technology issues to be resolved. Of course, it won't really be a wet blanket. It is, in fact, the challenge and the excitement of what remains to be done in the research. Dr. Robert White, I'm sure, is well known to many of you. He is the president of the National Academy of Engineering. He is recognized not only as a significant contributor to his fields of science, but also as an institutional, institutional innovator. He's the co-founder of the Travelers Research Center Incorporated, which is a nonprofit research corporation, where he led a major effort to design and develop automated systems for weather observation and forecasting. He formerly served as chief of the US Weather Bureau and a researcher at the Air Force Cambridge Research Center. He's a member of the Board of Directors of, of uh, Resources for the Future and the Draper Laboratories, and he's also a member of the State Department's Advisory Committee on Science and Technology. Dr. White, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Well, uh, we've all had a day and almost a half of discussions about superconductivity of all kinds, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this session. And we're going to be discussing critical technological issues uh, involved in applying new high temperature superconducting materials. In the past day or so, we've heard all about the pace of developments in superconducting materials, beginning since the discovery 
of the new class of superconducting ceramics by Bednards and Miller at IBM. And we've heard about the progress that has occurred in developing new materials with ever higher superconducting transition temperatures. Important information about the nature of these materials has come from physical studies of the new materials. And these studies have brought together people from many different disciplines in material science, engineering, and so forth. But there is still no confirmed theory of the physical mechanism by which superconductivity occurs in these materials. And there are considerable obstacles to preparing these materials in forms that are suitable for applications. And as with in other sessions, we will be discussing the matter of critical technological issues in two categories. First, dealing with uh, magnets. And we've heard a lot about uh, potential applications of superconducting magnets with high magnetic fields. Uh, these materials remain uh, superconducting at very high magnetic fields, and that makes them very attractive candidates for many purposes. But there are difficult processing and structural problems that must be overcome before many practical uses become possible. The new materials have rather limited carrying, uh, current carrying uh, capabilities, but uh, tremendous improvements uh, can be achieved in this area, and we've seen some of those, and this is very encouraging. The greatest obstacle is in fabricating a brittle ceramic material into the proper configuration for a magnet within a supporting structure that will allow these fragile materials to withstand the enormous forces that are created in high, mag uh, high field magnets. If these problems can be overcome, as we've heard, there can be broad applications, including motors, generators, magnetic resonance imaging systems, which you've just uh, heard about, accelerator magnets, magnetic levitation vehicles, magnetic storage of energy for electric power transmission, just to name a few. The uh, second area, of course, is in the area of thin films and electronic applications. And uh, in this area, where we might expect uh, early practical results, uh, superconducting switches, for example, that are extraordinarily fast, can be made with these technologies. Applications include computers and ultra-high-speed sampling. Obstacles to be overcome, again, involved processing. Now, everyone is excited about the prospects for understanding what are probably new physical mechanisms that give rise to superconductivity in these materials. And when the mechanism is understood, new possibilities will surely open up. We may also get some insight into structural problems associated with applying these materials. Meanwhile, efforts to synthesize new materials will continue, and fabrication technology will move forward hand in hand with a deeper understanding about the nature of these materials. Now, we all stand in wonder at the pace of discovery and the tremendous enthusiasm that the scientific and engineering communities have shown from this pursuit. And with all the excitement and remarkable progress to date, it is tempting to predict that we will have new superconducting technologies operating at liquid nitrogen temperatures, or perhaps even room temperatures in the next few years. But I think it's instructive to keep in mind that conventional superconducting technology, which uses relatively tractable metallic materials, took 20 years to develop to the point where large, high-field superconducting magnets could be fabricated reliably. And I suspect it would only be prudent for all of us to plan for a long haul to expect progress, both scientific and technological, to continue over the next few decades. The pace of commercial application will depend on successfully addressing critical technological issues, and that's what this session is all about. And we are fortunate to have with us for this session two individuals whose work has been seminal in this field. Uh, we have asked John Rowell and John Hume to address these questions. We're first going to call on John Rowell. Let me just tell you a bit about him, although many of you are aware of his work and his accomplishments. Uh, John Rowell has been involved in superconductivity research since he joined Bell Laboratories in 1961. That's 
over a quarter century, and at Bell Communications Research, Bellcore since 1984. He became involved in using electron tunneling as a tool for the study of superconductors. Very soon after the initial discovery of tunneling by Ivan Jaira at GE, and in collaboration with Philip Anderson, Raoul was the, made the first experimental observation of the Josephson effect and observed the magnetic field sensitivity of the critical current in Josephson tunnel junctions as the basis of their applications. He holds the first patent issued that was based on the Josephson effect, in which he proposed logic and memory elements based on magnetic field and current switching of the junctions. With William McMillan, he discovered and developed superconducting tunnel spectroscopy, in which analysis of the tunnel current between superconductors yields quantitatively the strength of the electron pairing interaction via photon, phonon exchange. He and McMillan were awarded the Fritz London Memorial Low Temperature Physics Prize in 1978. In 1975, he was a visiting professor at Stanford, where he carried out tunneling studies of thin film superconductors. Uh, in, from research in the early 1980s with Jochen Gierk and Michael Gervich on superconducting super lattices, he proposed techniques of making niobium-based Josephson junctions, which are now widely used, for example, in Japan. In 1984, John Rowell joined Belcor as an assistant vice president in solid state science and technology research, and is responsible for all superconductivity research in this newly created laboratory that was formed upon the divestiture in AT&T and the establishment of the regional telephone companies. He has a PhD in physics from Oxford. And let us welcome John Rao. John. Thank you. I, w I was asked to discuss the critical technology issues to be resolved in electronics, and as you've heard in this morning and yesterday, there are already many electronics applications of superconductivities, the conventional superconductors. Therefore, I see as the challenge the use of the new materials in what are present old or relatively old technologies. Can I have the first slide, please? And electronics, I equate with thin film use, and therefore, we might retitle this talk, The Challenges of Thin Film Materials, these new, <coughs> these new Materials. The next slide, please. Now, what we have to do with the new materials is relatively simple. In thin film form, we have to make them with useful properties. We have to process them without destroying those properties. And using those materials and processing, we have to build devices and circuits. That's going to take some time, as I think I'll try to convince you. But I do feel that first, we could do more. This is beginning to be done, but we can do more than we've done in the past few months to demonstrate the advantages of superconductivity at 77 degrees, at least in paper studies. And for that, we could assume conventional material properties. In other words, we could assume that we can create at 77 or 50K the properties that we have in niobium and niobium nitride, which are the conventional uh, electronics materials now, that they have, say, at four degrees. <coughs> but I assume uh, some of those reports are beginning to appear, and I expect we'll see more. Now, let me put up on the next slide what I regard as the primary challenge, and I think that may surprise you, and it's not a technology challenge at all, is to understand the superconductivity and other relevant properties of these new materials. I think it's impossible to create no, new technologies or even to recreate the old ones at higher temperatures without knowing the materials that we're building them from. If we achieve that understanding, we can optimize the performance of the devices and circuits. We understand the new superconductors. We can create new devices from which will come new technologies. Now let me go through these three steps <clears throat> that we need to be able to undertake to use these new materials. And on the next slide, we'll talk about making them or synthesis. Films can be divided roughly into two classes, thick and thin, and I suppose something between one and 10 microns is the, is the break point. I'm not gonna say much about thick films. I think John may mention it in the next talk, but they can be prepared by a number of techniques 
They can even be painted in some binder onto a substrate, which then can be reacted away by heating. Plasma spraying and sol gel techniques have been discussed. And thin films, less than a few microns, say, we can prepare them by all the conventional te techniques that are well known. Evaporation, sputtering, chemical vapor deposition, iron beam deposition and laser beam deposition are some of the ones that have already been discussed and tried. And when I prepared this view graph, I thought that the only useful critical currents, and by that a, a, a ballpark figure is something like 10 to the fifth amps per square centimeter at 77 degrees, if that's where you want to work, or even higher, up to a million amps per square centimeter, I thought that those films had only been prepared by evaporation. But I don't think that's true. I think some of the Japanese films that we've, <coughs> that we've heard about, in fact, were prepared by sputtering. So there's a choice of techniques and two, two of them are shown on the next view graph. In the top there, I show, show electron beam co-evaporation, which has been used at IBM and Stanford recently with success. It requires a number of evaporation sources, electron beam sources, with, which give beams of, elect, of yttrium, barium, and copper which come together and impinge on a substrate which is generally held at temperatures, say, about 500 degrees C. Now, that technique is versatile. You can vary the rates of each component separately, but it does need careful control of those rates, and it's a relatively expensive system to set up. Now, the other extreme, I think, is a technique that which we discussed recently at Belcor, where you just take a, t a target of the already pre-reacted material, in fact, the uh, superconducting material, and you impinge on it a pulse laser beam. Every time a pulse hits it, you get a plume of material ejected from the surface, which you can collect, again, on a substrate at, say, 500 degrees. The technique is simple, it's cheap, doesn't require very good vacuum. In, first, in fact, the first films we made were made in air in the room by just holding a target in front of the beam with a substrate nearby. <coughs> So, th those, so th that's two extremes of the methods that can be used, but I don't see that as a constraint. There's obviously lots of choices. Well, let me come to what I see as the first real problem on the next slide. Let's call this the 900 degree C problem. As I said, those substrates were held at uh, 500 degrees centigrade, which is already a relatively high temperature in processing, typical processing steps using semiconductors, for example. But after those films are made on that substrate at 500 degrees, they are not superconducting. In fact, generally they're not even conducting. And what's required is a heat treatment at 900 degrees in oxygen, as I've tried to show at the bottom of the slide. Films are held at not heated to 900 degrees in oxygen and cooled with some ramp down, relatively slow cooling, and maybe a hold again at 500 degrees. Under those conditions, the film <coughs> films do become superconducting. Now, perhaps this 900 degree temperature can be lowered somewhat. In fact, I think yesterday I heard temperatures like 700 degrees. But I think it's clear that at present, that in order to form superconducting films, a heat treatment at temperatures like 700 to 900 degrees is going to be required. So in the le next slide, let me just state 700 or 900 degrees, whichever turns out to be required, is a very high temperature compared to those used in processing silicon and gallium arsenide circuits. I mean, some of the steps are relatively high in that processing. But if we're thinking about hybrid technologies in which semiconductors and, super, and these superconductors are used together, then after the semiconductor devices are complete, they can only tolerate temperatures something like 450 or 350 degrees C in the case of silicon and gallium arsenide. Thus, you would assume, and I'll try and show you there's some complications with this, that superconductors in hybrid circuits must be applied before the semiconducting devices are processed. And this is in kind of constraint number one in the way that you might work with these materials. The second problem is on the next view graph. This is a substrate problem. Here I show the resistance versus temperature for a number of films which we made using this laser deposition technique on various substrates, strontium titanate, sapphire, 
and lithium niobate. And let me tell you that the ones on silicon oxide uh, were so much worse than this that we don't even have them on the view graph. <coughs> now you can see that the only films which have a high TC are the ones put down on the two orientations of strontium titanate. Even though each of these films was put down as much as we could tell under the same conditions and had the same heat treatment, in other words, put down at 500 and heat treated to 900 afterwards. To date, as far as I know, only films on strontium titanate substrates have useful critical current densities, in other words, 10 to the 5 amps per square centimeter or more at 77K. If anybody has any other information, they can tell me afterwards. There's one particular orientation of strontium titanate that seems to be particularly useful, and there's speculation that two effects are going on, or we know that two effects are going on. One is epitaxy, or at least a limited amount of epitaxy between the film and the substrate, the matching of the crystal structure. And the other is that there's some interdiffusion at this 900 degree heating step between the substrate and the film, and the interdiffusion with strontium titanate seems to be relatively benign compared to the other substrates that we've used, and I think that's a fairly common experience. So you can prepare films with this kind of required critical current density, but let me tell you that strontium titanate is by no means a practical substrate for any electronics application that I know of. It has an enormously high dielectric constant, Propagation of signals on strip lines on strontium titanate would be slow, so slow that nobody would consider using it. That's on bulk strontium titanate. Now, maybe you can use it as a buffer layer in order to induce this good growth and protect yourself from <coughs> reactions with underlying material. But this is a, a problem that must be faced, and it's one that we haven't been used to in, in the past with the materials that we've been using. Let me now turn to the second step, processing. It's on the second, uh, next view graph. Processing, again, is a well-established technique, many well-established techniques that are used for semiconductors, including lithography, chemical etching, plasma etching, ion implantation, E-beam patterning, ion beam patterning, and diffusion annealed in vacuum. Now, it would be nice if we could use these materials, whether they're being used on their own to make a squid or in combination with semiconductors, it would be nice to be able to use these processing steps without change. And in order to do that, we have to determine the thermal stability of the materials, who is what happens to them as we heat them, the chemical stability because they'll be exposed to gases, plasmas, liquids, and they'll be next door to other solids. We must determine the particle damage sensitivity. In fact, that's already been dem demonstrated because I think one of the early squids was in fact defined using damage to essentially uh, write out or destroy the conductivity in some part of the film. And perhaps most important, we must determine the reactions with substrates on which the films are deposited and with passivating overlayers. So summarizing just what I've said on the next view graph, we need to establish the chemical and physical properties of these materials and their compatibility with today's processing techniques. If they're not compatible, you can change or adapt your processing steps. <clears throat> but that, again, will delay implementation of the technology and might be very difficult if you're built thinking of hybrid circuits with semiconductors. Now, let me come to the f what I see as the first real processing problem, which is novel to these materials. Uh, on the next slide, the oxygen problem. If you heat these materials in vacuum or in gases other than oxygen, they will lose oxygen, <clears throat> and you've already heard what effect that has. This is an extreme case that I've shown here in that we heated one of the 90 degree materials in argon plus hydrogen, which of course uh, <clears throat> reacted with the oxygen. But the results would might be somewhat similar if we just heated this film, this bulk material, just in argon alone. And you can see that it, by the time you've heated this film to 300 degrees centigrade, it begins to lose weight. That means it's losing oxygen. And this loss of oxygen, I think you've already heard some implications yesterday about this, has very serious consequences that I'll show you on the next slide. On the, on the left, <coughs> I show a sample, a good bulk sample of 90 degree material, which uh, has a trans very well-defined transition, a well-defined drop in resistance as you cool the sample down and has a resistivity measured in microm centimeters. 
However, when this sample was heated in vacuum for 12 hours, about 400 degrees, a moderate vacuum, this would be a very common step in processing these materials. Uh, or, <coughs> or if you didn't know about this problem, it would have been a step you would have assumed you could take. After that heating process, the resistivity is measured in ohm centimeters, the material is a semiconductor, and at low temperatures, it is an insulator. So any heating in vacuum of a film of this material is not only going to destroy the superconductivity, it's going to destroy the conductivity. Now this is a challenge for processing. It is also, I, re I believe, an opportunity for use. In fact, if you sit there, you can actually think of devices, crude devices, that rely on this oxygen sensitivity of the transition temperature. Now we heard a lot about hybrid technologies, semiconductors plus superconductor. This material is a hybrid material. Depending on its oxygen content, it is either a semiconductor or a superconductor, or maybe both if you don't process it very well. Now you can restore superconductivity <coughs> on the next slide. All you have to do is heat the material in oxygen, and you can see this is the weight against temperature. And uh, starting at the lower left corner, as you heat the material, the, the weight begins to increase at about a little over 300 degrees again, increases to a maximum at a little over 500. Then as you cool it slowly, the dash line, it picks up a little more oxygen as you cool and uh, <coughs> has optimum properties by the time you've cooled slowly down to room temperature. Therefore, the oxygen content and metallic behavior and superconductivity can all be restored to heating, by heating to about 550 degrees in oxygen. Or as we've shown at Belcor recently, you can actually do that at much lower temperatures by exposing the material to an oxygen plasma. In fact, all we used was a little barrel reactor that's conventionally used in semiconductor processing. Now that work of ours was done on bulk samples and needs <coughs> to be demonstrated much more conclusively on films. So you can restore the superconductivity by this heating step. Let me summarize that. The next view graph, next slide. If you think about using this material in combination with others, what we can say is the oxygen content must be maintained during all processing steps, or if you lose it, it must be restored as a final step. And that's not so trivial if you think about a multi-level circuit. <coughs> This intru it introduces uh, constraints that certainly don't exist with the old superconductors, don't exist with today's semiconductors. And this has particularly serious implications for surfaces and contacts to the material. Uh, the applications there would be Josephson junctions, cavities, uh, contacts. Rem remember yesterday you were told that the coherence length in these materials is 20 angstroms or less, 15 maybe. That means if you have a surface of the material in which you deplete oxygen over 20 angstroms, which is only one or two atomic cells of the material in the long direction, the c-axis, if you destroy superconducti take out the oxygen over 20 angstroms, then you have no superconductivity. In fact, you have an insulating layer over 20 angstroms. <coughs> in many ways, the problem is not, it's, it's different, but uh, Reminds me of the problem that we had with uh, niobium and niobium tin tunnel junctions for many years, which I was involved in, in that the oxygen there also, the presence of oxygen in that case, degraded the superconducting properties of the materials at the surface, again over a coherence length, but remember the coherence lengths were longer. So this problem is even more serious than it was in those cases. Now the next step on the next slide is to build devices and circuits. And you've already heard a lot about that. I'm not going to go through any of them except to just make two general comments <coughs> on interconnects, bolometers, detectors, squids, tunnel junctions, and so on. One thing we haven't determined at all is the noise properties of the, these films. <coughs> Some of the noise will, in fact, be materials dependent. If the materials themselves introduce excess electrical noise, say at 77 degrees, so that the only way to get rid of it is to cool down, then of course the advantage of having a high TC material is lost. So the noise properties are important to determine. 
And just one comment, I can't resist it, having made tunnel junctions for a large part of my technical career. Tunnel, the simple, what I regard as the simplest tunnel junction, and that's probably not shared by many of you, but I regard the two film separated by an oxide junction as a simple one. Everybody else likes a little narrow bridge. But this is a tunnel junction that is being proposed for all kinds of switching, logic memory applications, and so on. It involves two films, and Ted Van Duzer says it, said this yesterday, so I'm only repeating it. These two films separated by an, oxi an oxide layer of about 20 angstroms or 15 angstroms thickness in order to get a decent current through it, the tunnel current. Now that top film, as I've told you, has to be deposited and then heated to 900 degrees. So after you've made the bottom film and oxidized it in some way, you have to reheat the structure at 900 degrees centigrade. And that's something that we certainly never contemplated before with any of the earlier materials. And I suspect that in fact what we'll have to do is invent a new kind of device or a new way of making the Josephson junction that avoids that second film, film heating. That's some kind of uh, internal deposition of the oxide layer. Now again, once we understand the physics of these materials, I think there will be new devices, and that's what I'm almost saying has to be invented in place of the, of the Josephson tunnel junction. Another measurement that we need is on the next slide. For almost any application in electronics, the only ones that we're seriously going to think of, about involve high, high speed, uh, megahertz, gigahertz rates. <coughs> there have been no measurements of the properties of these materials really at anything other than DC, very low frequencies. So we need measurements of this t type in electronics just as much as we need measurements of the critical current uh, in, as you'll hit here for the magnets in the next talk. We need to know whether there's the low power dissipation, the zero power dissipation, will be maintained <coughs> to relatively high frequencies. And of course, as you go on to cavities, even higher frequencies. Just one, one other comment <coughs> before I summarize. That's the next slide. I think it's essential that we begin to demonstrate, that doesn't mean necessarily in the lab, it means sometimes on paper, by paper studies, the advantages of superconductivities using these new materials, assuming we can make them over competing materials and technologies. We need to know what advantages interconnects of these materials at 77 degrees have over copper and aluminum cooled down, when it is cooled down to 77 <coughs> Kelvin, and I've, see, I've seen some reports like that, and I hope there'll be more and more definitive ones. We need to know the advantage of circuits built of, of Josephson junctions, if we can make them, versus silicon and gallium arsenide circuits when they are cooled to 77 degrees. What we really have to establish is where superconductivity introduces a unique capability that will be irresistible as a technology. I think we've had ample evidence in the past that we will not compete with or replace the well-established and very powerful semiconductor technologies unless we offer a unique capability. <coughs> and summary, on the next slide, what I've said is we first, and I, and I really do believe it's first, we need to understand these new materials, not just in thin film form. We have to <coughs> know how to make them and how to overcome or live with, and I think it'll be live with, I don't think we'll overcome it, the 900 degree sub, uh, heating of the material to make it superconducting, that problem. We have to find ways of overcoming this substrate reaction problem, and there are already signs that that is being tackled. Processing the materials, we have to find ways that we can do that compatible not only with the processing techniques we have, but with the other materials that we're considering using at the same time. And we have this oxygen problem, which as far as I know, is unique to these materials in technologies that I've been, <coughs> been used to. The devices themselves, we need to understand the noise properties of the materials and how that'll impact performance. And we need the high frequency properties. Now one final statement <coughs> that I want, want to make as, as uh, strongly as I can. What we've heard yesterday and today are all old technologies. I have not heard a single new proposal 
about a way to use these new materials. What I've heard is what we've done before with conventional superconductors at less than 20 degrees, and we're going to try and do all the same things at 90 degrees or 77 degrees. As far as I can tell, these are not conventional materials. And I don't know why we have assumed that their applications will only be conventional. We have only thought yet in conventional ways. If the superconductors are indeed different, we should expect applications that are different also. And I think this is the real challenge, what I'm trying to tell you this morning. In order to create new technology, not simply to implement old ones at are higher temperatures, we have to think in new and inventive ways, so please don't fail. Thank you, John, for an excellent uh, talk and description of some of the obstacles that need to be confronted, some of the technological problems that need to be dealt with, and I think the uh, basic conclusion that more understanding is required as the priority requirement is, of course, the correct one. Let me now turn to the other general area of uh, technological issues involved in the applications of uh, superconducting magnets. And we've asked uh, John Hume to uh, talk to us about the technological issues involved here. As many of you know, he's the director of corporate research and R&D planning at uh, Westinghouse Research and Development Center in Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Hume attended Cambridge University in England, where he received his PhD in physics. He's also a graduate of the Advanced Management Program at the Harvard Business School. And for a number of years, 1974 to 1976, he was scientific attaché at the US Embassy in, in London. Uh, he was a research fellow and uh, professor at the University of Chicago until 1954 when he joined Westinghouse. In 1980, he received the Westinghouse Order of Merit for his pioneering efforts in the application of superconductivity to electric power technology. He has uh, published over 100 technical papers relating to superconductivity, ferroelectrics, magnetic materials, and semiconductors. He received the John Price Wetherill Medal of the Franklin Institute in 1964, the IBM International Prize for Materials Research from the American Physical Society in 1980. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and he has served on many U.S. government advisory panels. It's my pleasure to introduce John Hill. John. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I'd like to say that I feel that superconductivity is uh, in some ways um, like a disease. It, um, it got into my blood in 1946, and I've never been able to get it out since. But I am very, very pleased at the developments that have occurred in the last year, and I'm hoping that superconducting technology will move along very quickly in the near future. I'm going to discuss the critical technology issues that uh, I think face the um, applications of superconductors, the non-electronic applications, that is to essentially to magnets and uh, such things as electric power. If I could have the first slide, please. My talk uh, will uh, essentially revolve around the following comments. Uh, obviously. High temperature superconductors are very new, and in fact, uh, the science, is, as we all heard, is not understood. Uh, we're still in the discovery phase. With the technology phase, it is really just beginning. It's its absolute infancy, and therefore, we look at the problems uh, through, through uh, the glass darkly, so to speak. I hope to show you that what is needed is a massive materials engineering effort. I think we will have to be very innovative in materials processing to achieve the superconducting conductors we need to operate at higher temperatures, specifically even at 77 degrees Kelvin. 
To il illustrate the materials problems, I'm going to take you back a little bit in history to compare the new superconductors with the old superconductors. So I need to tell you a few basic facts about the, the science and technology. If I could have the second slide, please. There's a very uh, old curve obtained in 1911 by Kamalingonis when he discovered superconductivity in frozen mercury in Leiden, Holland. The transition occurred over a range from 4.26 to 4.2 degrees Kelvin, close to the boiling point of liquid helium. This is actually a copy of Onnes' original curve. He went on to find a lot of other superconducting elements, notably tin, lead, thallium, and others, with different uh, transition points or critical temperatures. His work began to stimulate technological dreams in the 1920s and 30s for the use of superconductors in electric power systems to reduce losses. But there was a barrier to this technology, the critical field, the critical magnetic field of the superconductor. If I could have the next slide. This illustrates the kind of magnitude of critical field that elements like uh, mercury and niobium uh, have. Uh, what the critical field means is that um, above that curve, above the green curve, the material, the superconductivity in these elements was quenched and the normal resistance was restored. So you have a superconducting phase boundary, so to speak, below the curve. Well, these values are either really rather low. I've shown dotted on that slide the um, level of the saturation field of iron. And as most of you know, the copper iron electrode technology, both magnets and uh, the whole utility industry, is based upon operating with magnetic fields around the saturation field of iron around two tesla. So these fields were uh, much too low to consider applying the, uh, the elemental superconductors. This situation existed more or less until 1960 when science again came to the rescue through the discovery of so-called type two superconductors. The critical field of the type two materials is uh, typically shown in the next slide. Niobium titanium alloys, niobium tin, both have critical fields at very much higher values between 10 and 100 tesla, and clearly exceeding the saturation field of iron. So once again in 1960, we began to, delete, to dream of junking the old iron cores and entering a new age of building electric machinery with much higher fields and currents and with zero losses and greater power output. I went so far as to say that a new age of superconducting electrotechnology had, uh, had uh, dawned, and as shown in the, in the next slide, that to the right of the upper curve, where, where we got over, over two Tesla, we would expect to see products in superconductive electrotechnology to grow. Well, unfortunately, we ran into a few other difficulties, but you see, we took, we expected it to take well into the 21st century to really make this age come about. So I'd say we're more or less on target. What were the difficulties? Well, the economics, of course. The, the high cost of liquid helium refrigeration was one major factor. The high cost of superconducting wire is another major factor which still plagues us. Alternating current losses, something else that plagues us, to name a few. But we've been plugging away building some very fine, high-field superconducting electromagnets and laying a firm foundation for the advent of the new age. I've written down the, most, the five most obvious applications of type two high-field superconductors which are actually in use today. Many of them have already been mentioned, but the next slide shows this list. Medical 